Thank you. Okay, we move uh, to our fourth uh, speaker, Maria Teresa Maggiolino, and uh, she's going to speak of uh, uh, digital intermediaries in the, U in the U.S. and the U.S. antitrust law and uh, case law. I yeah, imagine. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Margarita, for having invited me to this uh, conference and to this uh, lively debate. As you can see, the title of my topic is quite broad, uh, Digital Intermediaries and the U.S. Antitrust Law. So I decided to tackle it from a very specific perspective, uh, from the perspective of uh, plaintiff, defendant, and uh, um, and judges. So my goal is to elicit uh, uh, the most frequent claims that are brought against uh, digital intermediaries and to talk about the judicial trends that we can elicit from the analysis of the case law. Obviously, uh, you know that uh, US case law can be rich, but at the same time it's complex, it is unruly and sketched. So you always need a criterion to untangle it, to decide at what decisions to look at. Also because these decisions sometimes do not mirror, or often do not mirror the prosecuting strategy of an authority. They come from the gut of the plaintiffs. So um, I decided, and this is my personal choice, to rely, to look at the decisions uh, regarding the first 15 online platforms operating as intermediaries in the United States. And obviously, uh, this is just a work in progress. Uh, and I don't wish to be exhaustive, at least not yet. So um, first, the method that I use. So I use uh, a database, a legal database, LexisNexis. I put the name of one of the intermediaries as a party name. I decide uh, the, uh, antitrust as the legal topic. And then I look at all the available, uh, the decisions available at a time in federal courts. So I didn't look at state court, just federal courts. And these are the data. So the first 15 uh, online platforms are Google, Facebook, Amazon, YouTube, Yahoo, Wikipedia, eBay, Twitter, Craigslist, Go, Reddit, Netflix, LinkedIn, Live, Bing. And uh, the amount of the antitrust decisions brought uh, or, or issued about them is 58 in 10 years, from 2005 to 2015. Um, so the, the first question that comes to my mind, that came to my mind uh, is, the following one. Uh, generally, US scholars are used to thinking that platforms providing free business uh, services are subject to excessive litigation. And especially, they think so because in the US, the idea is that plaintiffs go after the money. They follow the money. They look for deep pockets, as they did in the past when they uh, sue IBM, AT&T, Microsoft. So the idea was, um, since these are internet giants, they will be address, they will be the target of plaintiffs. Actually, I don't really know if the time has come already, because 58 decisions in 10 years are not so many, according to the US standards. And so this is the first uh, insights coming from this data. But let's go to the substance. What about the outcomes? Well, up to now, online intermediaries have never lost. At most, they have reached a settlement. So um, first, uh, a clarification. I looked just at the final decisions on the merits. I didn't look at the procedural decisions. So that 58 encompasses also procedural decisions. Uh, these are resu the results looking at um, the decisions on the merits. Okay, there are two there no query bias. Sorry? No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are two query barriers, two cases of unfair competition that came out just because uh, in California unfair competition law is interpreted according to antitrust law. So if you make the search, these results came out. Uh, and, but these are the more interesting results. As you can see, 17 cases terminated with the motions to dismiss granted in favor of the defendants. It means at a very, very early stage of the, of the lawsuit, before getting to discovery. And then uh, we, had, uh, we are still we have two pending cases and five cases, uh, which uh, the parties decided to, to settle. And so that 
we can infer were a risky business for the defendant that decided to settle just not to go on uh, uh, to a ju jury trial. And then we have three cases terminated with a motion to summary, uh, motion uh, for summary judgment, uh, meaning that they didn't go to trial, they didn't go in front of the jury, they terminated after discovery, after the judges have the opportunity to see the evidence supporting the claim of the plaintiffs. Hey, can, 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 yeah, sure. So why does the number doesn't add up? 52? 58. 58. Oh, well, because uh, 58 encompasses also procedural decisions. Instead, ah. decisions on the merits are much uh, are fewer. So the decision on the merits are 17 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 5 and two pending cases. So it's uh, 20, 23, 24, 10. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, the is I see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What about the claims brought? Yeah, yeah that's why he is here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, what about the claims brought? And here the numbers don't match again because sometimes in, in uh, merits decisions, we can, in uh, decision on the merits, we can have multiple claims. Meaning plaintiffs claiming time, claiming refusal to deal, claiming many uh, um, violations of antitrust law altogether in the same decision. And these are the numbers. So we had four frivolous cases uh, that the, the, the judges qualified as such. Seven horizontal agreements cases, so not so many as in the EU, as you were saying, just seven. And consider that three of them were all about the same topic, a no solicitation agreement between uh, um, uh, these companies for not uh, asking to the employees of someone else to work for them. So a very, very traditional case that has nothing to do with digital world. And then many cases that somehow require the use of market power of the use of substantial market power. So refusal to deal cases, section two, uh, other anti-competitive practices, real section two cases where you have to show substantial amount of market power, and then vertical cases. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, um, well, tie-in and vertical agreements where you need a bit of market power, 30% or more, in order to show the existence of anti-competitive agreements. These are the numbers. And what? Uh, now the point should be, well, once you get the claim and once you get the result, let's cross, let's put together the data. And here, uh, here are the data, the data together. You see many cases terminated with the motion to dismiss, many cases uh, as refusal to deal, Algorithm manipulation, AdWords manipulation, where uh, this VP stands for worker process, uh, negative feedbacks, tie-ins, uh, distribution agreements, many of them terminated at the motion to dismiss, so in, at a very early stage. The cases that move forward uh, in the great majority of cases were tying cases. And in a few moments, I will explain you why, why we have these results. Because if this is so far the quantitative analysis, not very sophisticated one, I understand from the economics, <laughs> economic side, uh, let's go to the qualitative analysis. So let's get started with refusal to deal cases. What was the claim in all these cases? It was about a plaintiff saying, I want to get access to your platform or I want to get access to the data stored and collected by your platform, and you told me no. That's anti-competitive. This is the, the, the claim of the plaintiff also. Um, well, how can we take all these cases? Well, the, the, the general mood in the United States is that uh, refusals to deal or quasi per se legal. I mean, uh, in, Trinco, in the Trinco decisions of 2004, the US Supreme Court said clearly that the exceptional cases where refusal to deal is unlawful stay out the other boundaries of section two. So, but for Aspen skiing uh, and, the case, and the conditions of Aspen skiing, refusal to deal is almost uh, uh, quasi legal. Um, what about in the digital environment? 
One interesting case, is, uh, case was about Facebook. Here, a, a, a plaintiff, a competitor of Facebook, of Facebook, asked to have access to the data of Facebook. And uh, the court dismissed the, 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 the complaint, saying that the plaintiff was wrong, arguing that absent some exclusionary conduct, the fact uh, that the social network refuses to deal with a rival design its website to be incompatible with that of competitors and refuses to enable data portability are unlikely to support antitrust liability. Likewise, in a case regarding Amazon, uh, the court stated that the reason why Amazon is not obliged to uh, make its platform available to, one, to the ones who want to sell their books on Amazon is that First, may acquire monopoly power by establishing an infrastructure that renders them uniquely suited to serve customers. Compelling some firms to share these assets would lessen the competitive incentives of the platform and all the rivals. Very traditional uh, argument of the US judges that we usually face in IP antitrust cases. You, if you share a resource, a competitive advantage, you lose the incentives to innovate, and the rivals uh, suffer a kind of slot, slot and slack because um, they are not interested in innovating anymore. They rely on you, and that work as a nanny. But these two cases were totally consistent with the previous case that was not part of my uh, set, which was my space, uni live universe. Uh, against MySpace. Here, the case was about a kind of product renovation. MySpace changed its uh, uh, platform, and because of that, uh, Live Universe was not able, better. The users of MySpace were not uh, um, capable of embedding videos and links coming from Live Universe on MySpace anymore. Here again, the court said the plaintiff is wrong, that there is no refu unlawful refusal to deal because Live Universe, uh, because no rival has the right to free ride on the traffic of the platform or, or a social network, and that no social network has the obligation to ensure compatibility, again, the word compatibility, with its rival products. And finally, a very uh, interesting case because it has to do with the advertising market, again about Facebook, where uh, one, rival, or one rival of Facebook was um, providing a software to run display advertising on Facebook. Uh, at a certain point, Facebook terminated the relationship and uh, so this rival was not capable of uh, uh, showing this kind of advertising on Facebook anymore. Again, the judges said that this was not an unlawful refusal to deal, and in particular, they, cr they uh, clarified that Facebook has the right to determine the terms on which it will permit the, its application developers to use the platform, and even more importantly, the right to dictate the terms on which its users can take advantage of the platform. This is a very US approach because it is like as if they were saying uh, the platforms can do whatever they want at their own risk. MySpace uh, uh, prevented the live universe to embed videos uh, and links and consumers walk away from MySpace. Um, Facebook is preventing this guy, uh, Sambril, from uh, running display advertising. Probably no consumer will ever run away from Facebook because of that choice. But still, if you create incompatibility, if you don't allow other people to work with you, maybe consumer could pu punish you for that. Uh, so th this just to say that they're very liberal. Uh, approach of the US can come in favor of the defendant and also in, came in favor of the plaintiff. But this was for the principles. But what about the technique? I mean, from a very antitrust point of view, what was the point in all those cases? In all those cases, the point was that the relevant market cannot overlap with the defendant platform. You cannot say Facebook is dominant, the platform as such is dominant, I want to get access to it or to its data. And you cannot say, according to the US judges, 
the same for any platform. You should define the relevant market in a different way. So they say in those cases, since the market does not overlap with the platform, on the one hand, the plaintiff didn't plead sufficient facts to hold the, defend to hold the, the defendants also, sorry, substantial market power. And on the other hand, any alleged harm due to, due to the exclusion of the platform from the platform was not an exclusion of the plaintiff from the market. Because if the market does not overlap with the platform, you cannot show antitrust injury in fact. You cannot show consumer welfare harm. So the question becomes, how should we define the relevant market then, if it doesn't uh, uh, overlap with the platform? And here is the case where uh, uh, that was not terminated with a motion to dismiss because the judges say, we like this definition of the relevant market. And this is the case about Kickflip, which is a virtual currency provider that offers services to software developers like King that publish games on Facebook and, and other social networks like Candy Crush. Well, if you have ever experienced uh, playing these games on Facebook, uh, you know that the experience, uh, um, the quality of the experience increases as much as you can use um, such uh, virtual currency and other services connected to uh, the game, which are, which are there for free. Now, what did happen? In 2009, Facebook declared that Kickflip was no longer permitted to operate on Facebook. So that was a termination of the relationship, kind of refusal to deal. Kickflip then brought an action, which is still pending, claiming that on behalf of the social network and its new service, Facebook credits that was displacing uh, Kickflip, Facebook was trying to monopolize the market for the virtual currency services for social games. This was the, the definition of the relevant market that the court uh, considered reliable. Uh, the idea here, here was that uh, developers can make money only by virtual currency, sir, but only by attaching to their games these services, such as virtual currency services. And that, the other element, games for social networks are not like games for um, web, um, mobile devices, games that you can find in stores, games that you can find on uh, uh, console, those for kids, also for grown up. Uh, and so the court says, that in the market for social network games, Facebook all the substantial amount of market power to use to monopolize the market for the virtual currency services for social games. So a narrow definition of the market. Now let's switch to um, one of the big cases, algorithm manipulation uh, that has been brought in the US. Well, here the, the claim is Google you control the search buyer, the search engine, sorry. You are manipulating your algorithm to reduce my visibility and hence to exclude me. Now, first of all, let me tell you something about uh, the scholars. People like Herbert Ovenkamp think that this claim is not a good one. Uh, they are not very worried about search engine bias because they think that the switching costs are low, as low and that uh, as long as disclosure is available and uh, um, people, consumers, users uh, can see which are the, uh, the assets controlled by the search engine and distinguish uh, uh, sponsored uh, results from natural results, there is no issue of competition law. And then they also argue that since these are matter of content and not matter of... Uh, con is this the government case? Or? No, uh, not yet. This is just the opinion of Herbert Ovenkamp. No, but the Google case you are... Yeah, yeah, I'm going to tell uh, that one. Sorry. No, no, you're totally right. Um, since this is uh, a matter of content, this is a matter of tort law, this is a matter of uh, consumer protection, this is not a matter of antitrust law. Okay, this is the US approach, we know it very well. Uh, you can agree or not with it, it's a matter of policy. Let's go to the FTC investigation. Well, what was, uh, um, what was said in this case was, okay, Google, 
unfairly manipulates uh, its uh, uh, algorithm and pushes down to the to the end of the page, to the bottom of the page, the ten links blue, the ten blue links. Sorry, meaning the results that consumers uh, um, search for when they make a query. And what do Google put before them? The universal search box. So here the case was, I look for um, Starbucks in New York. I write in Starbucks New York in the query. I get a page where I have sponsored uh, links. Um, the ones for which people paid. Okay. Then I have the universal box, which, were, which, is, which was made by Google, where you have uh, uh, the map of New York with Starbucks and the addresses of the many Starbucks places. And then after it, you have the links, 10 blue links, to TripAdvisor and other websites that are very well, um, that have a lot of expertise in providing uh, people with this kind of information. Vertical rivals, if you want. So, uh, these people ran to the FTC and said they are uh, uh, subtracting us visibility because they are putting us down at the bottom of the page and their results come at first. So they are uh, giving us a disadvantage. The FTC said the universal search box of Google is an innovation. It gives direct answers instead of reminding you to other websites. So it meets consumers' interest in a better and quicker way than the 10 blue links. For this reason, there are some efficient, uh, efficient reasons justifying its existence. And because of that, uh, we cannot, we cannot uh, uh, consider it anti-competitive on balance and they save it. Then there is also another case, which is Kinderstart, but this case was dismissed because, again, the plaintiff in the district of Cal Northern District of California, the plaintiff was not capable of showing market power. Even here, here, here we're talking about the search engine. Why? Because here the problem had to do with the advertising market. And here the debate is, as you already said uh, this morning, that we don't know whether to put, uh, and also in the US, they didn't know whether to put offline and online advertising together or not, whether online advertising should uh, encompass just search engine advertising or also display advertising, and whether when you go and count uh, the competitors on the search engine advertising, whether you should have just core search engines or also vertical search engines. These questions did not found clear answers. Why? Because on the one hand, the FTC and the DOJ in Google double click a merger of 2007 and in Google Yahoo an agreement that, then that did not take place then, um, they said that the search engine advertising market is a single market, uh, distinguished from uh, the display advertising. But still, there are many cases, uh, Trade Comet is one of them, where according to the judges, display advertising and search engine advertising do belong here. They do belong to the same market, and they do uh, they are part of the same market. So the difficult, the, the, sorry, the difficulties for the plaintiff to show market power of Google comes from these difficulties in defining the relevant market, which are a matter of economics. And we need empirical data. We uh, we need to know the demand, how consumers work. We cannot find an answer from a theoretical point of view. At least this is my opinion. Time cases. Ten cases uh, were the ones that go uh, through the lawsuit, the ones that have found uh, a lot of uh, space, a lot of room in the courtrooms. How do they work? Well, I chose uh, two um, Amazon cases. It was claimed that uh, Amazon was tying its own printing on demand service. Uh, with its platform, which allegedly dominated the market for online book sales. 
the district court of Washington granted Amazon a summary judgment because the plaintiff was not capable of showing coercion. This was the argument. You know that in the, uh, in the US you have to show that the, 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 the customer is obliged to buy the tired product with the tying product. So in this case, uh, the, the, the plaintiff was not capable of showing that he was obliged to buy, to, 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 to use the service provided by Amazon, the printing on demand service provided by Amazon. And in the second case that Amazon cited, all the same facts, uh, Amazon made a settlement clarifying and assuring the plaintiff that he had still alternatives to, um, to offer its books uh, to the final market. So, which is the bottom line of all these cases? That according to the courts, the existence of alternative and disclosure about the alternative, other printing on demand services which are available on uh, uh, the platform uh, is what does not make, is what makes the, 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 um, the tying be lawful, does not make the tying being unlawful. So the idea here is as long as there are alternatives and consumers know them and they can get them, they can achieve them and use them, the time, there is no time. Although we should consider these facts because they are uh, well pleaded. And this was another case uh, uh, involving eBay where the tying was very sophisticated because it was made by design. Here, uh, the time was between the platform and uh, PayPal, which is the payment service that eBay provides. And he, as you can see, um, the good position for the um, tired product comes from the fact that the consumer is buying the product and then he looks at the, at, at, at the eBay service to pay the product. Although, other services are still available. In order to achieve them, probably you have to surf in the website. The District of California, indeed, denied the motion to dismiss, and this case is still pending. Whereas, uh, in another case, the Court of Appeal granted the base summary judgment because the plaintiff did not show any antitrust injury. In fact, this was a very interesting case because I don't have time to, to talk about that. But in this case, there was no issue about the time. It was, uh, um, it, the court said it is a time, but the court said we have no way to appreciate the damage suffered by the plaintiff because this is a two-sided market and we have not, uh, um, we have not yet developed the, the, the technique to say what is a damage in a two-sided market, overcharge, Probably not, probably yes, and that's why the plaintiff didn't come up with a good theory of damage and the case was dismissed. I'm going to finish. Vertical agreements. This is a, a very interesting case. Google signed a distribution agreements with whom? Mobile manufacturers. So we move to the mobile world. And a, an agreement whereby the mobile manufacturers pre-install Google Apps on Android devices. Is it pro-competitive? Is it anti-competitive? Actually, the agreement allow devices manufacturers to install also third-party apps. So, traditionally, we would say there is no complete foreclosure. The, the, the channel, if you consider the, uh, the Android system as a channel, is open to Google Apps and the other ones. But yet, there are people that say multiple apps are duplicative, confusing to users and drain, we, probably this is the more important thing, drain on the device resources, which are very limited in, on Android devices. We are not talking about Apple devices. Therefore, these exclusive agreements may harm competition by subtracting a crucial distribution channel to third-party apps. This is the approach of the plaintiff in this case. The court didn't buy it. The court dismissed the complaint, holding that 
the very lows which in cost from jumping from Google Apps to other third party apps, just up, download them and use them, were enough uh, to exclude lock in effects in detriment on third parties. And so there could not be any antitrust injury. <coughs> in conclusion, up to now, no mention of big data. So we are talking about big data, but US judges have never heard about that, them, up to now. Second, very hard life for plaintiffs, because first of all, a general matter, the pleading standard, the plausibility requirement is high. Okay, in the US it's very difficult to overcome the pleading standard. That's a consequence of uh, Iqbal uh, and Tumbley. It is complex to assess market power and to define the relevant market. We already saw that. The law about refusal to deal is harsh in itself, so it's not a matter of digital world here. In addition, disclosure and law switching costs towards the existing alternatives are still their main successful arguments in courts endorsing search bias, tying, and vertical agreement cases. I don't know whether they are right or not. Perhaps we should better understand how consumers behave in the digital markets or in the digital market to know whether this is true or not. This is a matter of empiric data, I think. So we need more empiric analysis. So let me finish with a famous quotation from Bill Kovacic that says, the antitrust systems paddle furiously on a bicycle to catch up the industry developments that speed ahead in a Formula One car. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comment? Um, I wonder, um what a, a similar analysis for the EU would look like. Would look like? Uh, not yet, because the EU was up to her. So, <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, as she said, there are more 101 cases than uh, 102 cases. And, uh, well, my feeling, and so I, I don't have EU data to show you, but my feeling is that uh, probably we, our approach to the refusal to deal cases is more lenient toward plaintiffs. So probably there we could have more room, also because we don't need a determination of a previous agreement, which is the quintessential condition that must be met in the US to get uh, anti-competitive refusal to deal. Um, as to uh, algorithm manipulation, um, I don't know. There is one. There is one. So we are waiting. <laughs> and uh, what about uh, um, tying? Well, probably. Uh, also, EU approach is more is more lenient towards defendant. But I really believe that what EU people can do better than US ones is to have economists uh, within their uh, competition authorities to work on the analysis of demand and consumer tastes. So if we get, hmm? No, the FTC and the DOJ have probably 150 Yeah, you are right. Indeed, uh, they got it they right. They not they did. They yeah, yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, and they, did it, they got it right when it was to Google double click and the definition of the advertising market. All these market. cases are private and private Yeah, but they are 90, 95% of the US cases, so. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's my point. Yeah, uh, just a, 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 a comment on settlement that you said. In the US, everything is settled. So you shouldn't worry or be surprised because there are no decisions. Yeah. Uh, not even, people don't even go to jail with the decision. And that's the, that's the reason why the US system is unexportable in any other jurisdiction. It's distinct. And uh, so they settle all the time. And, and unfortunately, I agree, but uh, there is not much that we can do because uh, the system is organized in this way. To avoid? Yes. Well, please.
Um, it, it depends on how the EU Commission will be available to settle a case. Uh, he is totally right when it comes to private plaintiffs and uh, big firms. Big firms give money to the private plaintiffs and they settle. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's true. Uh, some of those cases then were brought by the DOJ and they lost at the motion to dismiss. So I hope for the future that the DOJ will plea better cases and probably the DOJ will not allow them to settle, I hope. <laughs> well, a difference between the EU and the US is that in the settlement, a judge intervenes. So they, they, they do provide uh, jurisprudence. In our case, it's an administrative decision and uh, there is no proof of any kind of harm, of a violation. So in terms of legal validity, I think it's completely different in this respect. Hmm? I'm not a lawyer, so, <laughs> but uh, I learned. Uh, yes. You mean streaming of content like YouTube, that one? Uh, accurately, which activity may be uh, carried out against monopolization in the online streaming market? For example, it's, in, in my opinion, it's the common problem uh, some, uh, in, in these uh, areas, especially uh, if we approach uh, competition between, for example, Amazon and Apple or Netflix marketing system. Mm -hmm. Sometimes monopolization uh, is not. Well, uh, um, I, I have some problems in framing the, the case. So, uh, would you say that the plaintiff would be a content provider who is excluded from the market because uh, uh, one of the platforms is, as such, already vertically integrated. So Netflix that refuse to a content provider to distribute his content because Netflix is giving well, here it depends on the theory of armor that you play. I mean, uh, if you think in that way, you think Netflix as a distributor of content. And if you think Netflix as a distributor of content, rationally, I'm kind of Chicago person, girl, still girl. Um, I would say that Netflix has no business, has no valid, um, um, anti-competitive reasons to prevent um, some uh, customers uh, from um, selling its products through Netflix. Yeah, sure, you can say it is vertically integrated, and so it wants to monopolize upstream the content market. But then, why is that? Is trying to do so? Is shifting the monopoly upstream? Is leveraging, uh, making a defensive leverage? of its monopoly? Well, it, they are diff difficult cases. Uh, my point is that in the end, those are very difficult cases. <laughs>